from Millville, New Jersey, and reaching around the world. New Life World Outreach Ministries presents His Word of Power with Pastor Richard F. Myers. Join us in a time of joyful worship, anointed ministry, and dynamic preaching from one of our Sunday morning worship services. It happens here on His Word of Power. Let's go. 
cause you're sovereign. Praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. All right, let's get our Bibles open. We're going to look at 1 Peter this morning. We're going to look at the fifth chapter. 1 Peter, the fifth chapter. And today we're going to talk about some things. If I get to them, it may step on your toes. So if it does, lift them up. 
Hallelujah. All right, 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, the eighth verse. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith. Bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you, Lord, that as we look into your perfect law of liberty, I thank you, God, that you are going to show us revelations that will help us understand the things that come against us and how we can defeat them. So I thank you today, Lord. I thank you for the promises that you've given us and the promises that you fulfill through your word and in the authority of Jesus Christ. I thank you for that now in Jesus' name and all of God's people said amen. amen. Last week we started talking about the five great temptations of the enemy. It's what he uses to come against us that we will fall prey to his devices. But the Bible also tells us that we are not ignorant of his devices. Amen? So we don't have to fall prey to what he tries to do to us. So I just wanna, I just wanna recap just a moment, if I might, of the five pleasures or the five treasure, uh, temptations that God has a weapon against for us. And these five temptations are pleasure, power, pressure, possession, and passion. And we learn some things. We, we learn that pleasure is that of the flesh. It's those things that are supposedly going to satisfy our flesh, but wind up never doing it. And the reason that never satisfies our flesh ultimately is simply because the flesh can never be satisfied. You give it a little, it wants more. You give it more, it wants more. It never ever stops demanding pleasure for itself. It is a hungry monster that if it's not brought under control, it will cause you hours of grief. The second thing that we learned about was power, and that was the power of influence or the position of influence. And why many of us get sucked into that? Because we try to find our value in our worth in those things that uh, show that we have power in our lives. We submit to those things because the enemy tricks us into thinking that when we are in control of something or everything, then we are above everyone else and it puts us in a place where we become prideful and we know that the Bible says, pride goeth before a fall. Can you say amen to that? If you need a reference for that, it is found in Proverbs, the 16th chapter, the 18th verse. The next thing that we studied last week was pressures. And those pressures are those things that traffic in your mind all the time. They are those things that just constantly run through your mind. Now, I'm going to tell you something about these pressures and about these things. You women are much more susceptible to those pressures than us men. And let me give you an example. See if you relate to this. How many of you women have sat down to relax for a few minutes, maybe read, maybe watch television, whatever it is. You sat down to relax and your mind kicks in gear of all the things you still got to do. Women, can you relate that? You're sitting there and all, instead of relaxing and taking it easy, you're there thinking, oh man, I got to wash the clothes tomorrow. I got to do this. I take the kids here. Got to do 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 and your mind keeps the pressures going. I want you to know something. Men are not affected as much. We can look at those things and ignore them completely. <laughs> men, if I'm telling the truth, say amen. amen. Yeah. So I say, we've got this processing thing going on. See, we, we look at it and we say, yep, mm-hmm, yep, that needs to be done. Yes, sir. 
When I'm good and ready, I'll do it. The part, though, that frustrates you women is this. We never get to the good and ready part. So therefore, the pressures mount up in you and you have to nag us and we think you're being a nag, but you just want us to do what you know we're supposed to do. Ladies, if I'm talking to you, shout amen. Amen. Notice I didn't get too close to Helen. I don't know, it's just built into us. We can look at something and, and put it off three or four days. And you know, what the, you know what the amazing part of that is? We don't feel guilty. You all do, ladies. You all feel guilty. It's a, oh, I shouldn't be sitting here relaxing. I shouldn't be doing this. I should be up doing my laundry, doing this, doing that. We can sit right there and say, <laughs> it'll get done. If I'm talking to you all, say amen, please. So those are the things that traffic in our minds. Those are the pressures. Then we've got the possessions. The enemy tricks us into putting our worth and our value in the things that we own. Do you have a nice car to drive? Do you have a, you know, a nice big house? You know, what, what is it you have? Because he tries to tell us that our value and our worth is summed up in those things that we have possessed because it demonstrates the level of success that we've had. I want to talk to you about that for just a moment. If you find your value in what you own and what you have, or what you possess, you've got it placed in the wrong place. Because your value can never be based on what you do or what you have. You can be the president of the biggest corporation in the world, and you can't put your value there. And I can't tell you the number of people that I talk to whose value is in their jobs, whose value is in their accomplishments. And when any of that gets pulled out from underneath of them, they crash. You know why? Because their values are misplaced. And the place that their values have to be is in who Christ created you to be. It's not in what you have in your pocket, the clothes you wear, the car you drive, the house you live in, the position that you hold, all of that is immaterial to God because those things only provide a place for you to be able to accomplish what he has, for yeah, amen. his purpose in your life. Somebody say amen. amen. And I'm gonna tell you something. As the ladies are guilty of that trafficking in their mind and we can ignore it, we're guilty of putting our value and worth in who we are, in our jobs, the positions that we have, the money that we make, and the possessions that we have accumulated. And that's exactly what God doesn't want us to do. And the more we put our value and worth in those things, listen carefully, the more we put our value and worth in those things, the more God will begin to shatter those. He will begin to remove them one by one because that's not where our value can come from. Our value must come from who we are and who God created us to be. Come on, say amen. So listen, it doesn't matter what job you hold. You, you can be the, the guy that rides on the back of a trash truck and the value that you have is as much as the guy who owns the company on the, the trash trucks that you ride on because the value is not placed in things or possessions. It's placed in the value that God has instilled and transferred into your life and especially as a born again believer, the value that God has placed upon you is unfathomable. We can't even begin to comprehend the value that God has placed in us. 
So if you're struggling with finding your value in what you do or what you have, renounce it, forget about it, repent, and get on with the life that God has for you. Somebody please say amen. Because that's the thing that we've got to, that's what we've got to become. We've got to become and see ourselves as God sees us. And whether you've been through hell and back again, whether you've been abused and uh, uh, used and everything else, you still have value to God, number one, and secondly, to humanity itself. So turn to somebody and tell them, I'm of great value. Tell somebody else that. I am of great value. Now, you don't have a mirror, but hold your hand up and look at your hand and tell your hand, hey, hand, I am of great value. Now, wait a minute. I looked around and there's a number of people who never put their hand up, so I ain't going any further. I'm going to give you a second chance because your value is summed up in what I'm about to tell you here. Lift your hand up and I'm watching every one of you. Look, look at your hand and tell your hand, I am of great value. You all are fools. I wouldn't do that. You just, you just drank the Kool-Aid. My, my, my. See, you have great value and the enemy will constantly try to devalue you. And then finally, it's the passions that we have and many of us have passions of success. Many of us have passions of attainment, but the real passion needs to be in the passion of Christ and what Christ has for each one of us on this earth. You know, there will come a day for each one of us where we will face death face to face. And we want to know that because we've surrendered ourselves to God, that the place and the space that we took up on this earth made a difference in somebody else's life. And as believers, that's why we're here. And it's the simplest things that you can do that will make a difference in some Buddy else's life. Can you all please say amen to that? We just need to surrender our purpose to God's purpose. And that's what Jesus did when he was going to the cross. He said, if this could pass, let it do it. But it's not my will. Thy will be done. So these are the things that we deal with on a constant basis. Those five temptations that the enemy throws at us all the time. The pleasures of life, the power in life, the pressures of life, the possessions of life, and the passions of life. So the question that we've got to answer today is this. If those are the elements that he comes against us with, how do we defend ourselves against them? How do we apply the word of God? How do we apply who we are in Christ? How do we take those things and defend ourselves against those very temptations? And so here's the keys, and I'm gonna give you several, and it may, we may not get done at all today, but I'm gonna give you some things uh, that'll help you overcome these temptations. Now, as you take each one of these steps and as you do these steps, let me explain something to you. The power of the enemy will not die overnight, but it'll get less and less and less and less and will have less influence on you the more you stand on God's word and do what God tells you to do. And it's slowly but surely will dilute the power that the enemy has over you. So here's the first step. If you want to beat any of these five temptations or all five of them, here's what you got to do. Number one, you got to check the sin that's in your life. Uh-oh. Is it, was it, Ron, wasn't there a song? Uh-oh, uh-oh. What? <laughs> Who knows what the song is? Y'all ain't no fun to say. You're just sitting here listening to me talk. Uh, uh 
uh-oh, uh-oh, uh, anyway. Frank, you're a singer. Come on, man. You don't know that song? All the single ladies? Huh? All the single ladies? Beyonce? All the single ladies? Uh-oh, uh-oh. He what? <laughs> no, I'm not. I get no respect. <laughs> got to check the sin in our lives. We got to check those things that are constantly robbing us from God's power in our lives. Please say amen. Listen to this. I want to read this to you. Psalms 139. It's verses 23 and 24. It says this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. You say, well, I, I, I don't think I have any sin in your life, in my life. I don't think I have anything that, you know, I need to repent of. How about those overindulgences that we all get involved in all the time? Hello? Anything that's excessive in your life, we need to stop classifying it as Oh, my little problem. Oh, my little iniquity. Oh, my little habit. Let me tell you something. It's sin. If you go out to dinner and have a drink and can't stop at one and you start taking two or three or you get buzzed, that's sin. That's sin according to the word of God. Hello? Come on, somebody say amen. That's sin according to the word of God. You go out to eat, and they say, here's your meal, and the meal is like piled up. I, I'm amazed that when we go to a, the church buffet sometimes, I am absolutely amazed at some of the plates that I see people taking. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, the, the other day, I, I saw... I, I, this is what the plate looked like. <laughs> yeah. They were looking around the plate to be able to see where they were going because it was stacked so high. Then after they ate all that, they went back for seconds because they had a little hole left. And then somebody brought in some century donuts. And after all this plate, they still had room for the donut. Partner, pa partner, I was protecting you, but man, he spoke right on up. But... It, but Tito, you know what we're talking about, don't you? You saw it yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Tito looked at me and said, oh my God, look at what Troy's got. And then Pastor Steve was sitting next to me. He said, oh, he must be bringing that for the whole table. They didn't, they, they didn't do that. They didn't do that. You know what that's like? That's like, oh, I've eaten so much. If I eat another bite, I'm going to explode. <laughs> Pass the pie and head for cover. <laughs> you see, that's funny. But what about your anxiety? Come on. What about your fears? What about your bitterness? What about your unforgiveness? See, we call them under all kinds of names and categories. God calls them sin. If you fail to forgive your neighbor, he will not forgive you. If you stop loving your brother and sister, he won't stop loving you, but he'll stop the flow of blessings for you because you've stepped out of that place of God. 
And so what we've got to do is we've got to say, God, search me. We've got to take this psalm, this psalm, and we need to, we, we need to take it into ourselves and say, God, search me, O oh Lord. And then we've got to evaluate. Do we get buzzed? Do we smoke over, over abundantly? We shouldn't be smoking anyway because it's going to kill you. But what about your smoking? You know, you're drinking. What if you're sniffing? What if you're chewing? What if you're shooting? Those are the things that are God calls sin. And as long as those are in there that you're not dealing with, you are subject to attack by the enemy unmercifully. And we're not even talking about womanizing. We're not talking about any of that stuff yet. But man, those are all possibilities that the enemy can use against you simply because you've called your sin something other than by its name. And that justified it for you. Yeah, well, I only hit my wife once. You know, I only abused her verbally once in a while. Yeah, I've only, I, I've, only, I've only been angry here and there. I, I've only, it's sin. We need to call it what it is. Because God can't deal with anything you will not acknowledge. He can't cook. He can't get rid of your anxiety and your fear. He can't get rid of your alcoholism. He can't get rid of your bitterness until you say, God, I'm an alcoholic. God, I got bitterness. I got unforgiveness. I smoke like a chimney, God. I got to acknowledge it. And then God steps in and he begins to make you whole. Remember when we, we were teaching a couple weeks ago, whatsoever is born of God. All of those are whatsoever are born of God. You know, right here in the church, we are believers, but we've got those issues in our lives that when we step up and call them what they are, then God will be able to work on them for us. Amen? Amen. Now, there's only one way, I'm sorry to tell you this, but there's only one way that you can change that, that you can bring those things to God and be cleansed and purified of them. It's called sanctification. It's the separation from the world, and it's a process that will go on until the day you meet Jesus. It'll never stop. Here's what, the, here's what the process is in order for you to be able first to announce sin uh, in yourself with God and ask forgiveness and ask for his help. But then what you've got to do is you've got to change your thought process. You know, many of us have what's spiritually called stinking thinking. We think and we, we, our minds go in the wrong directions. You know, the Bible says this. Listen to this in Romans 12 too. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable unto the Lord. You got to renew your mind. And let me explain something to you. Your mind will go any place it's led. You hear that? Any place it's led, it'll go. If you lead it or somebody leads it down the proverbial path of destruction, your mind will go with it. Your mind is subject to whatever gets inputted to it. Hello, say amen to that. So what makes the difference? Your will. You decide what your mind gets to hear and gets to understand. And I'm going to tell you, I wrote this this morning. Your mind will go anywhere, but your will is the one that makes a decision. I've been walking with God for, I don't know, since 1976, faithfully in ministry since 1976. Yes, I am good looking for my age. 
I didn't hear an amen. I only heard you laughing. That's two strikes. On the third strike, umpire, where's my umpire? Third strike, you stand up and you tell him, you out of here. <laughs> Listen to me now. I've been serving God for a lot of years and wayward thoughts still mm -hmm. come into my mind. The opportunity to hate, the opportunity to lust, the opportunity to, to, to whatever will come into your, your mind because it's been coming into mind all the time. And it's not always about sex and everything else, but here's what it is. It's something to take control of you and rob you from what God wants you to do. And here's how you fight that. And it's very simple. You know, the other night, I forget what it was, but it, there was an opportunity to get really aggravated at somebody. I will tell you that. I think, I'm not naming anybody. Why you look at Troy all the time? It wasn't Troy. Anyway, I had a thought, you know, about getting aggravated at somebody. And the thought passed through my mind and I started to think about it. And all of a sudden, I just stopped and said, I am not going to think like that. I am not going to think like that. I am not going to think like that. Would you please say that with me? I am not going to think like that. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so he becomes. And the moment you think it in your heart and you speak it out of your mouth, you got two witnesses in agreement and your mind's going to follow right along with it. But the moment you say, wait a minute, I'm not going to think like that. I'm not going to lust after that person. I'm not going to be angry after that person. I'm not going to be fed up with, I'm not going to think like that because that is not the mind of Christ. And I have the mind of Christ and I am not going to put up with that garbage. I will not think like that. that Steve, write a song. I will not, it's got to be a country song now. I will not think like that. I won't think like that. I will not allow my mind to lead me down that pathway. I will definitely not speak it out because I am putting it into existence, into the air for all the birds of the air to carry it. What you whisper in the darkness, the Bible says, the birds of the air carry it. Are you listening to me? So I certainly don't speak it out. I'm certainly not going to allow my mind to go any direction it wants. I'm going to simply say, I will not think like that. So then if I'm going to change my thought process, then the second thing that I also have to change is my mouth. Would you turn to someone right now and say, you look like you could. Just say that. You look like you could. You look like you could. Come on, say that to somebody. You look like you could. Part two, have a big mouth. Now we're going to say it again. Okay? Only this time a little bit different. I want you to point to somebody. Point to someone and say this, you could have, you could have, put your finger at them, you could have, 
Now take your finger and turn it around at yourself and say a big mouth. Do you know how many wrong things we allow out of our mouth? The Bible talks about the tongue is a fire, set on fire of hell itself. But here's what's happening though to us. When we check the sin in our life and we stop the thought process of that direction, then we've got to get our mouths lined up with the solutions to our problems rather than the conditions they've created. In other words, we've got to say, I will not think bitterness towards that person. I will not think jealousy. I will not think envy. I will not think bitterness. I will not think, 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 think. I will line myself up with the word of God and I will speak what the word of God says. And I need to speak it out loud. Somebody say amen. Now, let me clarify something for you. And the Bible is very clear on this. So I want you to get a hold of this and make sure you understand this when you leave this building today. God knows your thoughts and your intents. Amen. Satan does not. You have to tell him what your thoughts and intents are. He cannot read your mind. Would you please tell somebody sitting next to you, the devil can't read your mind. The devil can't read your mind. See, I will tell you something. You say, well, he must have read mine because he attacked me in the very area that I told my sister about. or I told my brother, or I told my aunt, or I told all the 200 people that I told them not to tell anybody else. <laughs> Don't tell anybody else, I'm just telling this to you. See, we gotta begin to speak the solution. You're gonna get doctor's reports. You're gonna get job reports. You're gonna get evaluations over everything that you can imagine can be evaluated. And you can either believe those or you can say, for me and my house, I know who we're gonna believe. We're gonna believe the report of the Lord. And Satan can only act on what you tell him. And how do I know that? Hebrews 4.12 says that God's word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It doesn't say Satan can do that. It says the word of God is the discerner of your thoughts and your intentions. So if you will just put your mind on the things that you are supposed to put them on and rebuke the thoughts that come to you and then open your mouth and speak the word of God, I can guarantee you it will work. Please say amen to that. It'll work for you. Why? Because now you're leading your mind along the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Hello? All of a sudden it starts to become a lot easier. Well, did you see what? You see what she wore? The, you see what she wore the other day? She looked silly, didn't she? Huh? Huh? Would you wear something like that? She loves two things. She loves it when I hug her. She can't get enough of that. I try to break away and she just holds me. She's like a stiff board when I do it. And the other thing, she loves it when I pick her out in a sermon like this because all those nine million people are looking at her right now. But all they see is the back of her head, so they have no idea who she is. You see, when we start thinking in alignment with God's word, when we begin to see what he sees and, and the solutions that he have, has, and we begin to speak those, 
then when the devil tries to convince us that he is winning against us, we have spoken the solution enough that those threats from him just roll off our back like water off a duck's back. Why? Because the word of God has insulated us and covered us in such measure that nothing can penetrate it from the outside. And you have to remember, the enemy will always try to penetrate you from the outside. He has no place in you. If you're born again, I don't want to get into that. We'll go to that. If you're born again, I said if you're born again, you can't be possessed by the devil. So don't anybody tell you you can't. You can be oppressed. You can be all kinds of pressed, but you can't be possessed. Because the Bible says, what place does darkness have with light? And I don't know about you, but I'm full of the light of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, I can see the beams coming out of your eyes. Tell somebody that. Wow. I can see the beams coming out of your eyes. See? And so here's the key. Here's the, here's the key for this whole thing. We're in a struggle. We're in a temptation. We're in a battle. We've gotten a bad prognosis. We've gotten a bad report from the credit department. They're going to repossess our car or our house. I'm going to lose my job in two weeks. I've been given my pink slip, slip or whatever it is that you've gotten that on. What do you do? Yes, you have to acknowledge you got it. But rather than stopping there, and there's the key, mm -hmm. so many of us stop at the prognosis and never go to the solution. Amen. See, the prognosis is you have cancer. The solution is I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. Amen. The prognosis is, you know, uh, you're, two, you're two months behind on your rent. And if you don't get some money to me soon, we're going to kick you out of your house. The solution is, my God meets all my needs according to his riches and glory. Direct me, God, in how I can pay that bill. Because here's the second step that many Christians are guilty of. If we don't stop at the solution, uh, at the uh, diagnosis or the prognosis, we go to the solution, but we interpret the solution for our own understanding. So here's what I'm talking about. They're gonna, they're gonna repossess your car if you don't make a payment. So we go to the solution. My God meets all my needs according to his riches in glory. Then we sit our butts down and we wait for the snow white dove to fly over and drop the money. And then two months later, they come and repossess your car and the devil tells you, see, God didn't meet your needs. No, but when you went and said to God, my God meets all my needs according to his riches and glory, God spoke back to you and said, get a job. da 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 Get a job. <laughs> you didn't do it. You didn't follow the instruction. You're sitting there waiting for the snow white dove to drop down the car payment. And God said, I got a job for you. Get out. Oh, no. I, no, no, no. I'm serving God, and God meets all my needs. You a nut job. God meets your needs according to the rules and regulations of the kingdom. You know what the kingdom's rules and regulations are? You don't work, you don't eat. Troy said, yeah, and I like eating. <laughs> then get a job. Ron, help me. Get a job. Da -da 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 -da. See, that's the rules and regulations of the kingdom. Hey, where are you going? <laughs> he he going to go get a job. Hallelujah. Merlin, he going to get a job. <laughs> he, 
He gonna stop running up and down that basketball court. He gonna get a job now. He, he's got a job. He, he does very well. He takes care of his family. See, we take the solution and we speak the solution without realizing that we're not lining it up with the word of God. So here's what we do. We first go to the word of God and let the word of God speak to us. Then we speak the word of God. Then we resist the devil and he will flee from us. You know how I can tell you that? Because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says, draw nigh unto me first. Then resist the devil and he will flee from thee. Next week, We'll come back and we'll pick this up where we're leaving off today. And we'll talk about the temptations of your life versus what others are experiencing. Bow your heads with me. I know I was speaking to somebody this morning. Da 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 da. Get a job. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you today. We thank you, Lord, for your promises. And Lord, though we've had fun, there is some important, there are some important revelations tucked into all that that God, we know that no weapon really formed against us can prosper when we line ourselves up with your way, your word, and your will. And so I thank you today, God. I thank you that for every one of us, we will take something home from this message and we will be able to, be able to apply it into our everyday life. We will have revelation upon revelation of how to be victorious over all the devices of the enemy and nothing by any means shall injure us. So I thank you, Father, that as we've heard the message, that Lord, we will take it in, we will apply it to our lives, and we will begin to see the victories through Christ our Lord. And I ask that in the mighty name of Jesus. Maybe you're here right now. Your heads are still bowed. Your eyes are still closed. Maybe you're here right now. And you've never had the authority and the power of God working for you because you've never asked him to do it. You've never surrendered your life and your way and your will unto the God of all creation who created you to be more than what you are right now. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never said to Jesus, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Save me from hell. Make reservations for me in heaven. And let everything above everything else, let you be the most important thing in my life because I know you will guide me and direct me through your Holy Spirit. Father, I need to be a child of yours. I need to be in the kingdom and I need to be assured that I have a reservation for heaven because I certainly don't want to go to hell. I'm going to pray one last prayer. If you're here right now and you've never asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, I want to include you in this prayer. If you're here this morning and you've never said to God, God, I need you more than I need anything else. If you're here this morning and you don't know with an absolute certainty that you're going to heaven and not to hell, then you want to be included in this last prayer. But maybe you're here this morning and you did make a commitment to Christ many years ago or last year or last week, but the detours of life have pulled you away from him and you know this morning you have got to get back to him. I want to include you in this prayer. So how do I include you in this prayer? It's really simple. You just have to let me know you want to be included. And here's how you do that. Right there where you're sitting, 
right there with nobody else, nobody else being concerned about you. All you're going to have to do in just a moment is simply lift your hand in the air and I'll see it and I'll include you in this prayer. Your life could be in serious danger. Please, if you don't know him, make sure you're included in this prayer. Or if you've left him and you don't walk with him like you used to, please make sure you're included in this prayer. So right now, if you're here, and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, or you did, but you kind of backslid, and you know what that means, but you want to be included in this final prayer of this service because you don't want to risk another day on this earth without God's help. Would you slip your hand up right now, right where you are? Thank you. Thank you. Who else? Thank you, right here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joe, over here, up here, Joe. up here. Uh, who else? Somebody else. A counselor is coming to you right now. Please just go with them. Come in there. Bill, come down here and get this young man. Right here. Who else? Come on. I know there's more. Come on. There's some more that raised your hand. This is the day that your life changes. Peter, just go with him. Over here. Kevin, would you get her? Please, thank you. Who else? Is there someone else? Please, don't leave here today. This is the day that your life changes forever. This is the day that God becomes your sidekick. This is the day that he takes you in his arms and protects you and guides you and directs you. Right down here, John, this young man right here. Priscilla, take this young man, would you? Right there, our young, young, yes, there you go. Who else? Is there someone else, quickly? This is your day, this is your moment, this is your very, very instant in time where God will be doing something absolutely phenomenal for you. Is there anyone else before I pray this prayer? Anyone else you want to be included in this prayer? There's one, two, three, four, five, six or so back there who have accepted Christ today. Anyone else? Anyone else rededicating your life? This is your moment. This is your moment. Father, I thank you right now. I thank you for the great decisions that are made this morning by these people who want to love you and serve you and follow you to the ends of the earth. Father, we are rejoicing today that new names have been written down in the Lamb's Book of Life and that we will see them again and rejoice in heaven together as we celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Thank you in Jesus' name. Make them feel welcome into the house of God. Praise God. Come on, stand up to your feet. Hi, this is Pastor Myers. I pray you enjoyed our broadcast today, and I wanted to let you know that our church family would love to have you join us here in our sanctuary for one of our weekly services. Every Sunday morning, we have dynamic worship, powerful preaching, an awesome children's church, and we see the power of God as he ministers to his family. Our Sunday services begin at 11 a.m. Then on Wednesday nights, we have ministries for the entire family. We have adult worship and Bible study. It's a night packed with the presence and power of God. And that happens at 715 every Wednesday night. For more information about New Life Church, you can go to our website at newlifeoutreach.org. There you'll find all the information you need to be part of our great church. And you'll see what God is doing in the lives of our families. Until our family meets your family on our next broadcast, may God richly bless you and yours.